Okay. Once again, welcome to our Bible study today. Hope uh, today's Bible study will inspire us. We are studying the topic, Can You Trust the Bible? The reason we are studying this is many people think Bible is an outdated book. It is no relevant today. Some of the stories are myths. You can't trust it anymore. So many doubts and questions. So this series will at least help us to understand if it is truly reliable or not. As I said, we have an outline. How we got the Bible? How did we get the Bible? We saw it last week. Today we will look at the canonization next week on canonical books. And then does science disprove the Bible? Does evolution disprove the Bible? Does archaeology disprove the Bible? Does history disprove the Bible? I think those four are key to most of those who don't believe in God asking. So we will be exciting studies, those four. Also, is Bible any superior to other religious holy books? And is Bible out of touch with postmodern society, as many people think so? And then finally, we will go through how can we study and understand God's word and get the best out of it. So today we will look at canonization of the Bible. But before we understand what canonization is and how were these books of the Bible written, what was the material used, what was the method used, we some of method things we used, but let's look at the material initially how they were written. In Hellenistic times, that's before Jesus, official records were often inscribed on stone or metal tablets. Literary works and detailed letters were written on parchments or papyrus. Though short or temporary records were written or scratched on pot sheds or wax tablets. So, and how, how did they make? Scrolls were made by gluing together papyrus sheets made from the pith of the papyrus reed and by sewing together parchment leaves, they made them like scrolls and on them were written. So most of the Old Testament and also New Testament, what you find in the original doc documents is like scrolls. And how were they written? They were written in columns and read by shifting the roll backward and forward for some wooden support on one or both ends, like how you see in the picture. Such scrolls were used for literary or religious works and seldom exceeded 30 feet, that's nine meters in length because of their weight and awkwardness in handling. They did, there's some books have more than one scroll like Book of Isaiah, which is big and other books have more than one scrolls. So basically the books, the material used was papyrus sheets and put in the scrolls, something like how you see in the uh, picture here. Now the question is, what is canonization? The word canonization comes from the Greek word canon, meaning read or measurement. Literal meaning is, it's a way to measure something. So a canonical book is one that measures up to the standard of holy scriptures. Thus, the canon of scriptures refers to the books that are considered the authoritative word of God. But the difficulty is the Bible doesn't tell us which books must be in the canon. and Bible doesn't give us those details. The difficulty in determining the biblical canon is that the Bible does not give us a list of books that belongs to the Bible. In fact, last week we said the word Bible itself is not in the scriptures. Determining the canon was a process. So what, since we don't know which book should be in a, considered as authoritative word of God, they have to use some method to determine it. That's what we call canonization. So what is it? It's a process first conducted by Jewish rabbis and scholars and later by, of course, early Christian church. Ultimately, we must understand this is key to our faith. As much as human element is seen by Jewish rabbis and Christian scholars coming together, which I will explain a little bit more. But the overall thing is this. It was God who decided what books belong to the canonical, uh, biblical canon. I think that's key for our understanding if we were to believe. 
a book of scriptures belonged in the canon from the moment God inspired it. If that means if, if God inspired these writings, whether man agreed it or not, they have they belong to the canon. It, it was simply a matter of God's convincing his human followers which books should be included in the Bible. So what the scholars did was to come together to have the influence of the Holy Spirit to convince them or to show them how to get what God has inspired to bring them together. Well, we know Bible contains two testaments, old and new. I think if you understand how the Old Testament came together, we will make it it's much better. Now, almost for half of the life of the children of Israelites, their only rule of faith was the Pentateuch, the first five books that Moses wrote. They became almost their uh, law. The strongest evidence for the validity of the Pentateuch is in the history and tradition of Israel. Even now, I mean, you, nobody can deny this Pentateuch if you go to Israel, even the Jewish, their main thing is this, Torah, they call it. These five books were written by Moses at the beginning of Israel's history after the exodus from Egypt. These writings were the ruling documents. They were all the Pentateuch was the ruling documents for the nation of Israel. It was like a constitution. The law of the constitution that governed their well-being, both spiritual and civil wise. Uh, so Pentateuch served like a document of the constitution, like how we have in the governments today. So those five books were the first beginning of the rule of God towards his people. But later, after the Pentateuch comes the histories and poetic or wisdom literature found in the Old Testament. Many scholars believe these were believed to have been canonized alongside the Pentateuch by the scribe Ezra. Their content can be trusted because the prophets trusted and used them. Whatever these poetic wisdom literature books that are there uh, seem to have been put together by Ezra. Everybody quoted them because uh, authors or the prophets have quoted them, including Jesus himself, they can be reliable. So the Pentateuch set up the office of the prophets as the mouthpiece of God. How do we know a prophet is a mouthpiece of God? Through the Pentateuch, how God spoke to Moses and later by many other prophets. So the, you can't, if Ezra would have heard, uh, uh, made a mistake in his canonization of scriptures, God would have corrected through prophets that came after him, but it didn't take place because many prophets quoted what was written in the Psalms and so wisdom like uh, Proverbs and all. So it simply says that God inspired those um, books. Then follows what the writings of the prophets. They were the last addition to the Old Testament. And if you see in the life of Jesus Christ, he actually quotes most of them. So canonization of the Old Testament completed by the time of Jesus, almost the, the canonization of the Old Testament was in its place. These are the words which I spoke. Look at what Jesus says in Luke 24, 44. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all things must be fulfilled, which were written where? In the law of Moses. That is what? Pentateuch and the prophets, both the minor and major prophets, and the Psalms, which are the wisdom books like Ezra the, what that were put together. So in quoting these three, Moses, prophets, and Psalms, Jesus has uh, publicly acknowledged the canonization of the entire Old Testament, which, which contains, of course, 39 books for us, but in the Catholic Bible, it has only 24. Why 24 in Catholic? Why 39 in um, Protestant Bible? Next time we meet, we will study when it comes to Apocrypha and putting books together. Okay, <clears throat> then what about, that's how the Old Testament was brought together. What about the New Testament? It was easy for the Old Testament because it, it was almost like a straightforward, but it, the many problems occurred when it came to New Testament. The New Testament canon refers to the group of books accepted as the authentic writings of the apostles and thus authoritative for teaching in the church of God. The generally accepted theory is that the canon was completed late in the fourth century. 
that means up to fourth century, they were still debating which book should be put together and not. So, and the most of them, uh, it took place in five periods in the New Testament into five periods ranging from the first century to its ratification in 397. The canon of the New Testament as commonly received at present was ratified by the third council of Carthage in 397. And from that time was accepted throughout the Latin church. I will make it more clear. That was just the dictionary, what, how the canonization came together. But the question is, how did all of them come together and uh, agree which should be included, which should not be included? So there's a criteria that the Jewish scholars and later Christian scholars come together to analyze how to bring these together. So one of the few criteria is apostles or a colleague or a prophet. That means whatever the writings that existed in the first century, they must have been written by apostles or a colleague to the apostles or the prophets as they were called in the New Testament. Then that whatever the writings they found must be orthodoxy. What does that mean? That must be true doctrine and its adherence as opposed to the heterodox or heretical doctrines and their adherence. Even during the first century, if you remember, there were false teachers. Paul was warning the churches to be aware of the false teachers and not to entertain them. So as much as there was true gospel, there were other people who were teaching false. So first century people, when they when they have to distinguish between what was right and all, they stuck to the orthodoxy teachings of the pro, uh, apostles and the prophets, that things they were taught from the beginning. That was another criteria. And most importantly, they were to be led by the Holy Spirit. When they read the scriptures, they must be able to see the evidence of the leading of the Holy Spirit. As they read to find out which book must come under this canonization, they must see the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the book that they were reading and this and also relevant they must they also looked at is was it relevant to the you know there are so many books that are written but were they relevant was it what it was so they looked at its relevancy in the times that it was written to to understand if that were to be under the canon then of course widespread long standing usage that's another form was this in circulation before we they got it into hand? Did many people acknowledge this book? Did many people understand? Did they use it? Did they uh, have a knowledge of these books? So during the first century, they all are aware of this, not just these books that are in the Bible now, but many other books. But they also had a clear understanding of what was the truth and not because the way Peter and Paul and many others taught them and told them to stay away from all the heretics and the false teachings. So they also saw how widespread it is and how long-standing usage it had. Was it a new phenomenon or was it there from the beginning of the writings of the apostles and the prophets? In other words, in make it simple, uh, as I said, of course, they're not to be led by the Holy Spirit. A uh, few more things is, was the author an apostle or have a close connection with the apostle. This is just an explanation to the previous uh, slide. Is the book being accepted by the body of Christ at large? That was every church, they, these books were circulated. So they also looked at the book that has to be in the canon. Is it largely accepted by many churches that existed at that time? Did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodoxy teaching, as I said before? Did the book bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values that would reflect the work of a Holy Spirit? So these are some of the criteria they used in order to determine what books should be put under the kind of canonization. Now, in order to understand even a bit more, we have to look at what actually scriptures that are in the um, in the Bible now actually talk of each other. That is another evidence that it is inspired by God. If suppose one author quoted another author, it's an indication that God has inspired because we know that Bible authors are inspired by God. For example, Paul considered Luke's writings to be an authoritative as the Old Testament. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, 18 
and he quotes talking about what Paul Luke wrote. Paul also recognized, sorry, Peter also recognized Paul's writings as scriptures, as Peter says in 2 Peter 3.15. Some of the books of the New Testament were being circulated among the churches. If you see some of the letters of Paul, which he sent to Colossia, Thessalonica. So he mentions the names and the books that source. So that's another evidence. And not, apart, apart from the Bible scholars, even the first century scholars, people who are associated with the apostles or the colleagues of apostles and also the leaders of the first century church, they also acknowledge these books. For example, Clement of Rome in 95 AD mentions at least eight New Testament books that he was aware of. Ignatius of Antioch acknowledged about seven books. Polycarp, Polycarp a, a disciple of John himself, acknowledged 15 books around 108 AD. Later, Irenaeus mentioned 21 books. And then, then Hippolytus recognized 22 books as the time passed by. But there was a problem with few books that most of them did not recognize. That was the New Testament books receiving the most controversy were Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 John, and 3 John. They were not actually included in the canonization almost up to the third or fourth century because of the literature, lit, literary style of how it was written or some of the things that they read there, they could not understand clearly. So it took time. So some of the uh, ways of putting them together, the first one is called Muratorian Canon. What does that mean? It, it's it's Muratorian fragment. Initially it was called also known as the uh, Muratorian canon in Latin, it's in Muratory, which means is the copy people believe is perhaps the oldest known list of most of the books of the New Testament. That means they looked at more, was some of the oldest copies that they could find of the uh, New Testament. That's why it is called um, Muratorian. The first canon, this which was compiled in AD 170. So the Muratorian canon included all the New Testament books, except, as I said, initially they had problems with these books, Hebrews, James, uh, 1st and 2nd Peter, and 3rd John. But in AD 363, the Council of Laodicea stated that only the Old Testament, along with one book of the Apocrypha, next time we meet, we will look detailed in Apocrypha, and 26 books of the New Testament, everything but Revelation were canonical and to be read in the churches. So by the time 363 came, Revelation was, because it was so difficult for them to understand, they were not able to put it together into the canon until that time, though it was in circulation and being used in different churches. But by the Council of Hippo in 393, on the Council in 397, they all affirmed the 27 books as authoritative. But the, the final... Uh, declaration of those 27 books actually took place in the uh, Chalcedon Council. Most books were easily accepted. The authenticity of others were debated, but 20 of the 27 books, as I said, by 180, but by 451, they have established the, uh, by in the Council of Cancer, Cal, Cal, Chalcedon Council, most of the books were officially affirmed as belonging to the canon. Now the question is, where is my... well, how did it, we know that until the 15th, 16th century, there was no printing press. Most of them were again handwritten and many people did not have access. We will study that in our next series, why so many denominations and how other things, but for now, but what happened during the reformation with the advent of printing, and differences between Roman Catholics and Protestants, the canon and its relationship to tradition finally became fixed. So because of the differences between these two groups, Catholics and Protestants. So during the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent, which took place between 19, 1545 to 1563, the canon of the entire Bible was set in 1546 as the Vulgate based on Jerome's Latin version. For Luther, the criterion of what was canonical was both apostolicity or what is of an apostolic nature and was Christum Tabet, which derives word or leads to Christ. 
That means when Luther started his reformation, the way he accepted, because he comes from a Catholic background and there's so many teachings that were against what was actually in the Bible that they themselves had. One simple thing, the just shall live by faith. That was the reformation power PowerPoint for him to start reformation. So what he read, what the church was practicing was different. So according to, in his own words, he said, I will, we will only believe if we can see the books that are there are of, has some apostolic nature. That means comes from the times of the apostles and they all must be geared towards one thing. That is what? To Christ. So that's how he criteria, he, his criteria worked in, in understanding the Bible better. But as, as much as he did not understand about Hebrews, James, Jude and other, but again, you know, we must never forget that culture and tradition has always influenced certain things in how we look at them. But later scholars believe these books have the authentication of the Holy Spirit and the theme of salvation, which they put them together to include in the 27 books. Now, look at one of the systematic theologian, what it says, the New Testament writings contain the final authoritative and sufficient interpretation of Christ's work of redemption. The apostles and their close companions report Christ's words and deeds. Look at how it actually happened. The apostles and their close companions report what? Christ's words and deeds and interpret them with absolute divine authority. When they have finished their writing, there is no more to be added with the same absolute divine authority. Thus, once the writings of the New Testament apostles and their authorized companions were completed, we have in written form the final record of everything that God wants us to know about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and its meaning for the lives of believers for all time. Since this is God's greatest revelation for mankind, no more is to be expected once this is complete. The canon is now closed. I think that's how they came to conclude. They could see everything that man should know already recorded from the apostolic period and what was written. Everything that is necessary for man's salvation has been put together and they felt this is good enough for the salvation of man. And then the canon is now closed. Next, next week, when well, not next week, next class will be about Apocrypha. We will discover a few things there. What if they discovered another book that they think is written by an apostle? What would happen to it? And why certain books that seems to be so much inspired are not written. But for now, after the 27 books of the New Testament, they felt that they can close the canonization of the Bible. Well, next week, when we come, not next week, next time, I will let you know which day that would be. Very interesting because during the first century, there were so many, we think it's only four Gospels. There were at least 80 copies of different types of Gospels that were found. Some of the names are associated with the apostles, the, some of the books, and yet they are not found in the Bible today. They were widely circulated in the first century where some, search, some churches accepted them, but they, they did not find their place in the canonization of the Bible. Why is it? Are they not inspired? How did they come to that conclusion? Only these books are there and not the other books. We will look into those details. It will be a very interesting study. Maybe whatever questions you might have today about this can be actually cleared better when we come next time and also understand certain books, why they were not included in the canon of the Bible. Okay, let me stop sharing and also... Please record.